What's up, everybody? Hope you guys are doing well. And since the Seahawks have finally handled all their salary cap announcing business, we have a basically full picture of what the 2024 salary cap looks like right now for the Seahawks. I saw on a couple of uh, sites that the Seahawks are actually last in the league in cap space right now. So that gives you an idea of how up against it we are. And I wanted to break down exactly what we're looking at in terms of like future projection here once and for all. And after I make this video, unless we do something else, I'm, I'm going to be done with the conversation. Anything that you could possibly ask about should be in this video when it comes to salary cap stuff right now. So we're on Spotrack. And first of all, let me scroll all the way down here to point out that everything is now accounted for. Previously, there were at least a couple players down at the bottom of this list that had no cap hit, and now they are all gone because they've all had their cap hits added. Um, the one that I think slipped through the cracks for me was Artie Burns, but he is here. He's on a 1.1525 cap hit, so basically vet min. And with that, combined with the announcements we got the other day about Hankins and Wallace and Ankrum, we are done. We are good to go. So that's everything. So with all these players signed, and by the way, it's 61 players. A couple people thought that the players that didn't have their cap hit added yet weren't on the counter. They are. They just didn't have a salary yet. So 61 total players. And if you count every player on the team... We are currently sitting at negative 5 million in cap space, so we are over the cap if you count everybody. If you only count the top 51, we are 3.2, approximately, call it 3.2, under the cap. So either way, we're right up against it, man. There's very little money left. Remember, this does not include the draft, and Spotrack calculates the draft out for us. They project we're going to owe about 8.4 million in cap space for draft picks in 2024. Remember, that number will go up and up or down if the Seahawks trade down or trade up in the draft, and they almost certainly will do that at least once. So this cap hit number is probably not even going to be accurate at the end, but it's going to be close. It's going to be close. So when you take a look at this, and you take a look at the information that we have about things like practice squads and um, buffers for midseason stuff, we can get a pretty good idea of where the Seahawks actually sit in terms of a financial situation. So to put this in the clearest terms possible, I did the uh, manage roster thing here, which is kind of cool here on Spotrack, kind of a cool little tool. And I did some manipulations. So, first of all, I wanted to account for the draft class. So, I took our player cap hits, the list, and I added two things. Joshua Onujiogu on an $8.4 million cap hit. Now, obviously, we're not going to give Joshua Onujiogu a contract that pays him $8.4 million. But what this is, is a stand-in for the draft class the approximate cost of the draft class. So Onu Giogu doesn't exist. He, he didn't make the team. He doesn't exist. He's just a placeholder for the draft money. And then you have Brady Russell, who I added here with $6 million because $6 million is the practice squad plus rough injury buffer slash trade buffer that you need going into the season, right? So... <clears throat> again, Brady Russell doesn't actually exist here. He didn't make the team. I'm just using him as a placeholder for the uh, six million that's gonna have to be invested there. So you add those two numbers and you add in the draft picks, assuming every draft picks makes the team and no UDFAs make the team, which odds are decent that there's one draft pick that doesn't make the team or ends up on the practice squad, but there's also decent odds a UDFA makes the team, but it wouldn't change anything all that drastically. So at that point you'd have 68 players and you need to get down to 53. So what I did was I cut a bunch of players at the bottom of the um, list who are unlikely to make the team. So I released uh, Andrew Whitaker, Jonathan Sutherland, Brian Kobach, 
Matthew Gotell, Latrell Bumpus, Lance Boykin, Levi Bell, Aesop Winston, Cody White, Drake Thomas, Ty Okada, Patrick O'Connell, and Tyler Mabry. Some of those guys may make their way back on the uh, practice squad. Some of them won't. They were all making either 915000 or 795000 So they were all very cheap. But the point is, there's no room on the 53-man for those guys because as of the end of the draft, we had 68. Now, in actuality, <clears throat> we're going to carry far more than 68, but I'm talking about when the season starts because you have that 90-man roster during the offseason, but when the season starts, you can't have 90 players. So those guys who get brought in for camp are all going to go, and these are the guys who I estimate would go as well. I also released Daryl Taylor and John Radigan, which is a little more significant, but that saved $6 million combined. And those, uh, that series of moves freed up a bunch of cap. And theoretically, at that point, you've arrived at your final 53-man roster for the season, and you've accounted for everything. You've accounted for every possible cost. And when I did all this, the final number I came up to was... Negative 2.3 million. So I was able to get it all the way down to negative 2.3. But the um, customary ways of going about getting under the cap couldn't quite do it. We fell 2.3 million short. So at that point, the op main option, the primary option might be we're just not going to have a buffer this year. We could just say, you know what, we have no buffer. We're not going to make a trade. And if somebody gets hurt, we're just going to have to wing it. We're just going to have to freestyle it midseason and try to figure something out that's cheap because we'd only have like 700000 for injury stuff, which is like one player maybe. So that's an option. Or we could let go of another slightly more expensive player, like say Michael Jackson. He's on a $3.1 million tender. You let him go, you save all of it. Now you're losing a valuable player. But that frees up about 3.1, and that gets you under the cap if you do that. That would get you to the positive. Again, remember, everything's accounted for. So the only thing that matters at this point is getting this number into the positive. And the other alternative would be to restructure one of your bigger contracts. The options being Geno Smith, DK Metcalf, and that's, that's honestly really about it. I don't think anybody else would be even a consideration um, I guess you could extend somebody, but I don't think that's likely to happen at this point. So if you're not comfortable extending one of those two guys, then one of the previous two options is going to have to apply. Or you add a void year to some random player's contract. You could add a void year to Lockett's contract so that after he retires, he has like a cap hit of, I don't know, $3 million in a future year, and he's just going to count against the cap, and it's not that big of a deal. Teams survive that stuff all the time. So, yeah, that is where I think things sit as of right now. As of this moment, if the Seahawks were to stop spending in free agency, use their draft picks exactly as they're currently set up with no trades, and then set up a normal practice squad and a normal midseason trade injury buffer, they would be $2.3 million in the red. So, not going to be that hard to get out of that, not going to be that hard to get out of negative 2.3. But the question is, how do you want to do it? All right, so that should answer any salary cap questions, I think. I, I think this lays it out as plainly and clearly as possible. All right, see you guys later. Go Hawks.